why is it so important that we share the science of fiction? And what do we do with it once we have it? That's today's big question, and my guest is Maddie Stone. Maddie Stone is a prolific science journalist. She is a doctor of earth and environmental sciences. She's the former science editor of the technology website Gizmodo, which I love, and the founding editor of Earther, Gizmodo's climate-focused vertical, which I love. Maddie has edited articles for The Verge, uh, Polygon, and Grist, and her original and award-winning journalism has appeared in, oh my gosh, uh, National Geographic, back when they had writers, uh, The Washington Post, The Atlantic, The Guardian, Grist, Vice, MIT Technology Room, Technology Review, and Drilled, and many other outlets we love and link to basically every day. An avid science fiction fan like me, Maddie runs one of my favorite blogs called The Science of Fiction. It is an email newsletter and a blog, if you're old, that explores the real-world science behind fictional monsters and alien planets and stuff like that, which is checks out all of my boxes. Welcome to Important Not Important. My name is Quinn Emmett, and this is science for people who give a shit, like Maddie. In our weekly conversations, I take a deep dive with an incredible human like Maddie, who's working on the front lines of the future to build a radically better today and tomorrow for everyone this time. So our mission here is to understand and unfuck the future. Our goal with you here is to help you answer the question, what can I do? Maddie, uh, welcome to the show. You've already had quite a day. So thank you for, for hopping on. I appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. So excited to be here and talk about what is truly one of the most fun subjects for me to talk about. 100%. We're, we're, we'll skip over all like the in mining and, and just talk about uh, how do you transport whales onto a bird of prey. Maddie, <laughs> truly one of my favorite movies. We'll, we'll get to it. I also recently looked up what year it was made and it's very upsetting. I like to start with one important question to set the tone for, you know, what hopefully is a fun fiasco, which is why are you vital to the survival of the species? And I encourage you to be bold and honest about it. Oh my gosh. Uh -huh. I'm a very humble person by nature. So this is a really challenging question for me. I believe but it. am I vital to the survival of the species? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I would say tying it back to the theme of our conversation today, I feel like I have long carried inside me this unusual, unusually strong interest in science, particularly earth science, the environment, how the natural world works, also preserving the natural world. I've been an environmentalist since I was like five years old and they started doing construction and logging behind the playground where I played out in recess. And me and my little kindergarten friends like, yelled at the construction workers from across the fence, which was Fuck probably yeah. not the coolest thing to do. But I've been an environmentalist as long as I can remember. I've been, you know, pursued science academically for a long time, just a big science nerd, love communicating about science with the world, but I've also been a huge science fiction fan my whole life. And I think there is an essential intersection of science and science fiction, a way they interact with each other, shape each other, and help the public understand what's really essential about science. And I've tried to leverage that as, as a way of connecting with audiences and helping the world, my you know, small sliver of the world that I communicate with, mostly via the internet, understand complex scientific topics, understand sort of big picture trends taking place in society, and understand you know, what needs to be done to build a better future through this intersecting lens of science and science fiction. So I guess that's you know, how my... How I, I hope to see my contribution matter. Um, that was amazing. In a of hundred years. <laughs> Look at that. That was amazing. Look at you. Hard yeah. question. <laughs> it's a it's a it's a completely ridiculous question that I I mean truly you you are first in our hearts but guest number one seventy eight or something. I've been asking it for a long time, and can get some ridiculous answers, but also something sometimes they're pretty meaningful and provocative. But most people are just like, "What are you talking about?" So I appreciate your your candor and your attempt at putting something together there. We are going to get to the science of fiction and all of that, which I find so meaningful for a thousand different reasons. 
I grew up on science fiction. I still live and love science fiction. It's what I put on at night as long as it's not too dark these days. My wife is a screenwriter and producer and I did a little of that. So it's I get the whole the whole thing is 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 so important to meet people where they are in, in the worlds they already care about to show them what we are what we are capable of and also the real science that can inform those things. So before we get to that though, let, if we could, because a lot of folks listen to this looking for an answer to the question, what can I do? And it turns out that's like a lot of what we really do best. We, we contextualize some things and we'll give you the news about some things, but we always try to pair it with like really reputable specific things that you can do about those or a potpourri of things that are very measurable and measured in that respect that we've kind of done the homework for folks. And the podcast is a version of that and that, you know, it's folks like yourself who, as I like to say, work on the front lines of the future. And Without going into your entire life story, folks do find ways into working on the front lines of the future. Either they're a student or they make some sort of lateral move or they run a endowment, whatever it might be. By listening to these stories and having empathy for people who, how they found their way in to this. And you didn't just go straight into the science of fiction. I mean, you've had a fairly hardworking, illustrious sort of here and here and now here and now beat which which obviously is is still going as of literally this morning and your work has been so prolific and meaningful across obviously earther the post grist drilled we love drilled the verge all these places you are honestly uh to me at least probably our most impactful journalist around ev metals and and mining and 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 the clean energy metals and mining beat which I assume stems from your super cool doctorate in in earth sciences, but I do. There's a connection there. Yeah, well, it's there. I mean, um, again, just a quick list, and, and I wrote these all down. And truly, like this has helped me really. Truly, your reporting has helped me get like a one hundred one to two hundred one in this stuff. The Microsoft work this morning about uh, using uh, the company to how how can they stop enabling fossil fuels? Right, aluminum smelting e-waste from toys, unionized mining for these kinds of materials, wind turbine magnet recycling, right to, you've covered right to pair, repair like seven different ways, Rus Russian nickel supplies, cement concrete. It's, it's, all, it's all the stuff, right, that it's so easy to ignore, but that is the hard game, right? You get, constantly see like climate tech company raises this money. It's like, well, it's, it's a, they're a software company. It's like this is the hard stuff that we've got to cure, and, and it's very complicated and controversial from – you know, mining on indigenous lands to unionized work to waste to obviously the, the deep sea stuff and what that does to potentially does to ecosystems. But I, I do want to talk for a moment about your evolution or transition from your doctorate, which is a lot of writing in itself, to journalism and earther and all the rest. Was, was journalism always the goal or how did you get there from yelling at construction workers at age five to starting yeah. with her and where you are now? Yeah, great question. Journalism absolutely was not always the goal. I think for a long time, I thought I was going to go down a more traditional science research academic track. I, I did my undergrad in ecology. I love the idea of a career that allowed me to kind of spend half my time outdoors, hiking through the woods, going to amazing far flung, flung places and, you know, half my time in a climate controlled lab, looking at data on a screen, trying to understand a really nuanced problem and, and make my, my contribution to our, our collective knowledge base. So I did start out thinking I was going to go down this more traditional research track. I got into a PhD program, was about a year and a half into that program when I realized, you know, really not a fan of a lot of things about academic culture. I was mean? frustrated with <laughs> the, the, the sort of slow pace at which research results get, you know, translated into societal understanding and, you know, from there into, into meaningful action. And, you know, as someone who's uh, always been an avid consumer of the news, particularly climate and environmental news, it felt like there was this cognitive dissonance between these, you know, these big problems that we face that are becoming sort of more real and more apparent every day and the the very slow and plodding pace of scientific research 
the, the type of research I was doing intended to ultimately help us wrap our heads around those problems in a more meaningful way. So, you know, I still have a lot of friends and colleagues who've gone down the, the science route, but I realized pretty early on in this PhD track program that it was not for me, that the, the, part, the, the part of this whole process that I really liked the most was the communication of the end results and explaining mm you know, why this matters and doing that either in a talk format or writing up the abstract or conclusions in a research article was always sort of the most, the most valuable part of the process to me. And all of my advisors thought that this was very strange because most scientists do not care for writing, mm. do not care for public speaking. Right. Yeah, no, thank you. <laughs> and, and so I got a lot of kind of raised eyebrows at my just general interest in science communication, but also a lot of a lot of support for it to give my academic advisors credit where due. And so about a couple years into my PhD program, I, I had done a lot of research. I was writing a dissertation, but I was all, I also started sort of actively blogging on the side. My dissertation, not to get too in the weeds about it, because it, it is really quite niche and focused as these things tend to be, was about soil carbon in tropical ecosystems and sure. what keeps it in the ground and what causes it to leave the ground. Do and it. looking at a lot of interactions between minerals and microbes and processes playing out on like a really small scale. and what that might mean for the future of our planet. Anyway, as I was working on all of that, I started a blog on the side about environmental microbiology and all the cool things that microbes are doing and we can use them for because I just find them fascinating. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that had to do with mining and recycling applications of, of microorganisms. So this was just like fun thing I wrote about once a week, pulled up a research paper, wrote a blog post on it, sent it out into the ether and a couple hundred people might have read it. As the years of dissertation writing wore on, I started to take this side gig of blogging a little bit more seriously. You know, as I was, I, I, I was committed to, to finishing the dissertation, to seeing my PhD program out, but also realizing I was, um, I, I wanted to do something quite different after I finished than what a lot of my peers were doing. Again, I had a good amount of support from my academic advisors, including being allowed to do a, I guess you could call it a glorified internship, working for the university newsroom at the University of Pennsylvania, um, essentially shadowing and working as the underling for the two staff science writers there. And so that was sort of my first introduction into journalism. I wrote some you know, profiles of scientists and press releases about cool things going on on campus and new studies that were coming out, that sort of thing. And so that kind of gave me a nuts and bolts education into very crash, crash course education into, into what, you know, what a press release is, kind of how the sausage gets made in science communication, how findings get disseminated from universities to journalists to the wider public. Around that same time, and we're talking like 2013, 2014 here, I also started a second blog called sure, The Science yeah. of Fiction. Literally anything um, to not write your dissertation. Anything to not write the dissertation. I know. I was, I was, such <laughs> my sister in law uh, got, got hers in, in psychology and said she always, she said, I had the cleanest apartment of any of my friends. She's like, all I did was like, type, type, type. No, thank you. I'm just going to go uh, dust again. So. Yeah. yeah, totally. So I, around that time, this was about a year before I was supposed to be finished with my dissertation, I started a second blog called The Science of Fiction. And this was, if if you remember the old Gawker media and family of sites that have mm -hmm. since sort of scattered to the wind under various owners or been shut down, there was a free <laughs> blogging platform within Gawker that anyone could use to start a blog called Kinja. It's still the back end of the Gizmodo family of sites. I was an avid of io9 and Gizmodo at the time, and I started my own Kinja blog, blogging about the science of science fiction, because again, huge nerd, always been a big fan of sci-fi, and it was just a fun additional way to communicate about science fiction. And that got noticed by Annalie Niewitz, who was the editor-in-chief of io9 at the time, which was fairly shocking to me, 
I had never pitched them a story or considered pitching them a story, but a couple of my art articles got reposted to io9. Subsequently, Annalie reached out to me asking me if I wanted to be the weekend editor at Gizmodo because they needed someone to blog Fast and Furious seven <laughs> times a day, oh. Saturdays and Sundays. <laughs> This was right around the same time that I was actually finishing my dissertation and being like, what the hell am I going to do next? And sure. so um, Blog Saturday and I, had, Sundays. I had taken on a few freelance assignments for different outlets at that point. I had like a small collection of like actual journalistic clippings to my name. So I didn't have much of a resume, but she sort of took a chance on me. And that's how I got my foot in the door at Gizmodo. And I spent a few years there. And then founded a climate vertical there called Earther. And I'm now jumping years into the future. But that's that's sort of the compressed history of how I got my start and how I transitioned into journalism. I love it. Thank you for that perspective. It's helpful because, you know, I. it's funny. My wife, I'll mention her a few times. She's the greatest person alive. She, we grew up on E.T., right? Kids, kids riding bikes, solving, solving goonies, like you name it. She made a TV show for Apple TV a few years ago called Home Before Dark, and it's inspired by this young, literally a real-life journalist, an eight-year-old when she first hit the news, Hildy Lesiak, whose dad was an investigative journalist in Brooklyn, and I'm gonna, it's, there's a very good chance I get this wrong, but basically she used to tag along with him on, you know, to interview, I mean, he did, like, dark stuff, and she was super into it when she was six and seven and eight, and I believe... He covered Newtown and he mm. was like, you know what? I think I'm out, which is understandable. And they left and moved back to the small town he was from. And he was like, I'm just going to write a book. And she's like, that's great, but I'm a journalist. So I'm going to keep going. And she published something on Blogspot, you know, whatever it might have been. Uh, and it like scooped the local paper on a murder or something. And she was nine and it got all this national attention. But the town freaked out. Who are you to come in here and say and all this stuff? But like Hillary was like, this is incredible. She got a book deal, you know, in the newspaper. All this. Anyways, my wife and her best friend made a, a, t a fictionalized TV show about her, which is basically young Hildy and her friends r riding bikes, solving crimes. It's amazing. But um, I love that. Yeah, but I think about you screaming at construction workers uh, about uh, getting too close <laughs> to your playground, but it, you never know how you're going to get into this thing where you're like, I have to do this. And there's definitely a thousand variations along the way, like you said, doing an entire dissertation, which is like, I'm committed to it, and we're writing about the soil, which, by the way, is like incredibly important and still questions like we, we're not 100% sure on and we need to answer before we keep selling fake carbon offsets to people. But that stuff... It really does matter, and it, it it does. I have done seven hundred different things, and and it I do look back and go like, if I removed any of those, would I be here? I'm not sure, even though mm -hmm. they don't totally go one to one, or it felt like a waste of time at then or now. But I I, I try to Im pass that on to, to folks. I'm a thousand, so I try to pass that on to people who feel like I'm lost or I'm doing two different things or I freelance in six things and I don't know where it's going to be. And it's like I don't know where I'm going to be. You know, it's like and you don't know. What's going to add up yeah. to get to get you there? Absolutely. Some people people often ask me if I if I were to do it over, would I have like done the whole PhD again? And I really don't know the answer to that question. But you know, it despite not having used that in furtherance of like a scientific career, I do think in some important ways it got me where I am today. I don't know if I would have found science journalism if it wasn't for the confluence of you know, random opportunities and lots of free time in front of a computer. Sure. That. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and at such a specific moment of, like you said, Kinja and Tumblr. And, and I mean, that was, I think that was post blog spot, but the point was like, there were these tools and it was sort of federated ish, you know, and, and we all worshiped IO9, but like the, the comment section was huge, you know, that, that whole thing, it was, yeah, boy, that feels absolutely. Like a long time. That yeah, feels you like could a long time you could build. It was a long time ago. That feels very like early internet now. But yeah, uh, no, there were there were bloggers on Kinja who had 100%. big followings who were not affiliated with Kotaku or Jalopnik mm -hmm. or Io9 or any of those sites. Yeah, it was oh it was a whole thing. 
That's crazy. unfortunately all of those old science and fiction blogs have been scrubbed from the internet. I was able to download like really? internet archive or yeah, internet wayback machine has some of them. I, I really need to set aside an afternoon to go through the process of cataloging them. Um, we got to get those back out know. there. Thank God for the yeah. wayback machine. I know way back. I, I am such a fan of the internet archive for so many reasons, but particularly because it, posts those early blog posts that played an yeah. important role in my career. I told someone recently about how I, I, the hard drive with all my college papers, I was a, I was a religion major, which is interesting because mm. I'm, you know, flag waving atheist, but I took a, I thought I wanted to do political science, took one class and the professor annoyed me freshman year. And I said, well, I'll go do this. Cause it's also how we understand the world. You know, so many people, it's also so much of our conflict and how people live their day-to-day -day lives and all this stuff. So same thing, but it wasn't a dissertation, but I remember writing about, mm -hmm. you know, the history of, of armed religious conflict between India and Pakistan and, and what that land was before and all this. And it's like, does that apply now? Not necessarily, but I still ask, questions about why people do what they do why they have to do what they're doing and how why why we keep making so many of the same decisions we keep making and and that's part of it or it's inspired by it would i do the same thing i don't know it definitely wasn't on like forbes top 10 most lucrative college majors when i when i graduated and you know a thousand years ago but you know i think it's fair to say most of us don't really know what we're doing in our early 20s and you know no yeah lucky or if we make 40s. it out of there yeah. with or early 30s yeah. with some sort of semblance of a career trajectory. Yeah, yeah. yeah trajectory is, is a word. It's doing a lot of work there. So before <laughs> we get into present day science of fiction, I, I feel like we do need to talk about all of the new Star Trek the past few years. How did this... There has been so much. There's been so much. Before it was just Chris Pine, and he's great, you know, but... There was a period, you know, where we post DS9 and some other things in Voyager where, where, where we had, I mean, I think that first Chris Pine was like 2009, right? And then Into Darkness, which yeah, I support, yeah. by the way. I, I liked Into Darkness. But then mm -hmm. we got this Paramount Plus was like, we're going to make all of it. Ha yeah. What is your favorite? What, what, do you, what have you jived with? Like, what has really spoken <sighs> to you? Because I've got, That's I think, some popular and some controversial opinions. Mm, okay. I don't know whether my opinions are going to be popular or controversial, but I'll just put them out there. Of the new Trek, and I have watched, I think I've watched all of it. Actually, I haven't started the new season of Discovery. I'm only that. two in, so don't worry. We don't have okay. to get into it. I'm, I'm yeah. behind and terrified of reading the internet. <laughs> yeah, no, I've just been avoiding it. I love Lower Decks because oh. I think that Lower Decks is like, just it is just such a warm and wonderful tribute to all things Star Trek. It's clearly written by like the biggest Trek nerds who ever mm -hmm. lived. It tells actual Star Trek stories that like fit within the canon and feel consistent with the rest of the franchise. But it is also like constantly making fun of Trek tropes, you know, just in a thousand ways, big and small, providing the loyal Star Trek audience, the people who've been watching this since they were kids, all kinds of just like Easter eggs and mm -hmm. just like fun, delightful things that I never really expected a Star Trek show to do. So a big fan of Lower Decks for like branching out, doing something completely different and like mm -hmm. totally nailing it, in my opinion. Sad to hear that there's only going to be one more season of that I, show. I, my anger is is like untenable about that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Strange New Worlds has been kind of surprisingly great. I think it has revived a lot of the feeling of, you know, classic original series Star Trek while modernizing a lot of the things that desperately needed to be modernized mm -hmm. about it. Mm -hmm. And yeah, kind of strikes strikes a cool balance between tapping into that nostalgia and getting the fans of original series or people who grew up with the 90s Trek, in my case, you know, having that like warm, fuzzy feeling of this reminds me of my childhood in some way, but also providing something like really new and obviously something that couldn't be done in the yeah. 60s or the 90s. So I'm a, I'm a big fan of both of those shows. I, I love the, the musical episode of I, I, it was so World. good. I was just like 
so shocked by how fun that was. I mm-hmm. was bracing myself for it to be yeah. like a total train wreck the entire time. <laughs> but that to me really sort of brought home the fact that they've got a team that like really knows what they're doing. The fact yeah. that they could pull something like that off and not have it be like a cringe fest. I don't think you time. go for it unless you're pretty confident. It reminded <laughs> me of, did you ever get to see not, not sci-fi, but a truly wonderful show called Crazy Ex-Girlfriend? I think I did. No. Oh my God. It's all about mental health and it's fantastic, but it's all music. And you're just like, oh my God, like the, the confidence to pull this off is just out of this world. But yeah, when yeah. they were like, oh, there's going to be a musical episode. I was like, oh my God. Oh, Brace I'm yourself. So nervous. Yeah. <laughs> I'm so nervous. <laughs> but I tell you, yeah, and- and, sorry, I was just going to say w- one of the things that has been so emblematic of, about this run to me is not just the, you know, lower decks not focus, but like willingness to just throw trope after th- trope at you and shine a light on it and then move on so quickly, but have it be a part of it. But also, like you said, do old school Trek things, but also have these characters who you love and empathize with because they're just constantly getting things wrong. But besides probably season two of Discovery, which tried to do kind of a almost like a DS9 type feeling to it, which I loved, these shows have all really worn their heart on their sleeve. In mm-hmm. such a way that, you know, a friend and I were just talking and he's he's commuting from Richmond to D.C. once a week. And, and he's always got this train ride. And, and I said, look, you just got you, you wouldn't pay for Paramount Plus. I was like, fine, I'm, I'm, I'm gifting you strange new worlds like you just got to you got to do it. And he was like, well, that's really nice. I was like, Trek has been our safe place, like for our entire lives, you know, sleepovers doing TNG. And this version of that has mostly felt that way. Like it's really just, not just the show and the theme, but these characters really wearing their heart on their sleeves. It's so warm and empathetic Mm -hmm. and goes overboard with with kindness, even in Lower Decks where they're, you know, ripping on each other or frustrated with one another, which happens. They're in these high stake things, but I don't know. That is, my wife always calls it in in a loving way, like me watching my spaceships blow up at night, like where that brings me back to an easy place. But yeah, there's something about it, and it seems so intentional. You know, I remember at one point yeah. Discovery last season, something like that. There was a point, in, and they showed the bridge, and it was all, at least not Earth males on the deck. And mm. they were so supportive and and warm to each other and ready for whatever came. And I was just like, this is the thing that I think has driven me to where at least I am, where it's just going like, like, I don't think tech is necessarily going to save us. It's like the people and how we decide to use it and, and make sure it's inclusive of everyone. But I don't know. That's the thing that I've, I felt has always spoken to me. And it's why I love science fiction so much. Nailed it. There we go. <laughs> there you go. I don't- yeah. No, I mean, I completely agree. It's, it's so earnest, but not in a, just in a very genuine way. And in a way that provides such a nice counterbalance to so much other pop culture and science fiction that's out there where everything has to be, you know, a little edgelordy or a little apocalyptic or, you know, pointing out how everything is terrible and how everything is going to continue to be terrible. I think Star Trek has always, you know, at its roots, it's like utopian science fiction, right? Mm -hmm. And I think the new series have broadened my understanding, at least, of what it means to uh, be a utopian science fiction show. I think uh, a utopian science fiction show can go to some very dark places, but as you say, there is always this underlying earnestness, this underlying warmth and spirit of kind of camaraderie. And, you know, we can do this if we all work together and, you know, all of us together is something that the, I think the, what that means within the context of Star Trek has expanded a lot over the decades. Yeah, 100%. Um, well, together has changed just, a lot in, in the context yeah. of decades for Star Trek, certainly. Yeah, absolutely. So it's been a nice evolution, but also nice to see the show sort of keeping to its roots in some essential ways. Yeah, and it's easy to feel like, boy, all of a sudden we've got f- five new things and Lower Decks is ending and Discovery and then what? And then and you got two, I know. two, two seasons of Picard that I feel like we could talk about for hours and then a third one that was <laughs> completely different. But by the way, show run yeah. by the same guy. And then they were just like, we're just going to do the thing that people want. And talk about like, they just fan service, fan service, fan service. And I was like, great, give it to me. Absolutely. I, absolutely. This, is what I, this is what I need after thinking about climate change all day. But... I want to root, again, getting to science fiction in Star Trek 4. 
about the voyage home and, and the way this movie kind of wrapped up the first few movies and Leonard Nimoy directing it again and him being like, we're not doing, we're not doing the battles. Like I'm not, I, I don't want to do it this time. I want to do something that's, I mean, so grounded compared to anything else, but also people always joke. They're like, oh, it's the one with the whales. I'm like, fuck yeah, it's the one with the whales. Like it's everything about that movie means so much to me. I think from, again, it was from 1986. So I was four, but to now, like, again, the heart on their sleeve, like, well, I guess we got to go, we got to go find the whales. So the alien thing inexplicably needs to hear from them and then it'll go away. Yeah. It yeah. seems like your love of I, science fiction feels feels similar to that. I think so. I was negative too when that movie came out. I didn't see it until I was a teenager. But it yeah, it it had a really big impact on me and I I again have been an environmentalist my whole life. I loved those cheesy 90s movies, the Free Willy series, so Fuck I yeah. always had kind of a th- thing for whales and then i i grew up watching star trek deep space nine a little bit of original series but the movies sprinkled in there and yeah i just i i think you know the the lens the the way that leonard nimoy approached that film as not wanting as you say for it to be you know a film about war or us versus them but to have it be sort of a collective problem that we need to address and a very topical problem for the time I should add I'm not sure if it was 1986 but it was some year right around there that the first international moratorium on commercial whaling went into effect and this was sort of the height of the Greenpeace save the whales campaign and people you know public concern over commercial whaling and what that was doing to our oceans and biodiversity was really starting to reach like a fever pitch and so that was obviously an issue that Leonard Nimoy cared about and he made it kind of the central plot line of his Star Trek movie, which I just think is so badass. Yeah. I, I, I kudos to him for, for doing that. And uh, yeah, you know, I don't know if we're ever going to have another movie where it makes sense to transport a humpback whale into a Klingon warship. So that will always have a treasure place in my heart. <laughs> I just love this thing. And again, my, my wife is this incredibly hardworking and wonderfully talented and creative and, and amazing human who, who makes these things. And I get to watch the struggle of even someone who is very successful, like for the system to constantly spit it out and tell her no, you know, partly because she's a woman and partly because the system is so broken, like top to, top to bottom. It's not great. But any idea, if you were like, here's the deal, we're going to we're going to at the end, we're going to beam the whales onto the cloaked bird of prey. We just powered up from the USS Enterprise aircraft carrier, and then we're going to fly away and we're going to take the lady with us. Um, this system right now would be like, no, like, no. <laughs> but I appreciated that some, for some reason, they let, they let them go for it. And like you said, I don't know when we'll see it again, but this is what I feel like science of fiction does for me when it, when it comes in my inbox. Mm. It feels like things at least I remember reading in to go even back farther, like wired in the 1990s, these questions mm-hmm. of, and this is my question. I always, one of the two questions I always try to get to, which is like, why do you feel like you have to do this work? I can tell why you have to do all the mining stuff. Like that is so important and it's so integral to so many decisions we're making right now. But you know, it felt like he had to, they were like, go make your shit Leonard Nimoy. And he was like, okay, here we go. Mm-hmm. And it feels like your conversations with these folks who you talk to for science fiction and your love for it feels a similar way, which is like, this is really important. And it's easy to just be mm-hmm. like, it's movies and TV, but it's not. Tell me mm-hmm. about like how sort of this latest incarnation of it and like why you have yeah. to do this as well as all the, you know, scooping Microsoft. I think it's, I think that you know, pop culture, the stories we tell are so important to how we see the world. And they're often an essential part of our identity growing up. They often shape our career paths in in weird and unexpected ways. I've spoken with so many scientists over the course of my career as a science journalist who have identified some early you know, science fiction movie or book that they read as sort of the spark that launched them down, 
you know, a career path studying galaxies or exoplanets or microbes in Antarctica. And that really, I think, tells us something about how humans are, you know, we are creatures of stories. We like to tell stories. Stories help us understand, make sense of the world. And science fiction stories in particular, I think, are just such a powerful vehicle for understanding big macro complex problems in new ways and sort of gaming out solutions that maybe don't make sense now or don't make sense 10 years from now, but could make sense in a hundred or a thousand years. Should there be, you know, X, Y, Z new technologies available, new societal structures in place. Like science fiction is sort of a breeding ground of ideas for what is possible if we remove some of the, the, the structural barriers in place today. And, you know, it's not, and, and I, I truly feel that, it, you know, this isn't just fun sort of thought experiments about, you know, what could be, it would be so great if we, you know, were able to, you know, fly around the galaxy in these faster than light ships and visit all these different worlds and meet all these different alien cultures. Like, that's all great. But like, it's not, it's not just about um, this is fantasy escapism. This is this is really a vehicle that allows us to think about you know the problems and the challenges facing society today and how we could con- address them in in a less constrained future, in a future where we've sort of changed the underlying conditions in some way. And you know there are books that have been written. There are professors who give lectures on all of the ways that science fiction has inspired real world innovation. And that's part of it. You know, we see all these one-to-one examples of uh, a visionary science fiction author, you know, Jules Verne, Arthur C. Clarke, all these kind of golden age sci-fi authors thinking of technologies that we now have in our world today. But that sort of one-to-one, oh, it happened first in science fiction and now we have it in our world is that I think is just one small part of the power of science fiction to affect change in the world. I think much more broadly speaking, it allows us to reflect on our problems in a kind of an open and imaginative space and think outside the box when it comes to solutions. So, you know, climate change is obviously one of the most pressing, if not the most urgent problem of our time, something I spend a lot of time thinking about and writing about as a climate energy journalist. And I think science fiction has a really powerful role to play in thinking up how we're going to solve it and not just, you know, dreaming up new types of transportation and new Mm -hmm. forms of energy, but how we actually rebuild and restructure society. And I think there's powerful examples from the writings of Octavia Butler um, all the way through to a lot of modern climate fiction authors today who are really actively using fiction as a vehicle for, you know, imagining a different future and imagining how we could, you know, restructure our world in order to live a little bit more sustainably on this planet. So I think to wind down this long and rambly answer of why this is important you know, it's, it, it, it's, it, we, we all love stories. We don't all love science fiction, but a lot of us love science fiction. It feels like, you know, this, this kind of nerd culture has exploded in recent years. It's a huge opportunity to communicate with audiences that isn't necessarily in the traditional route that you get information out there as a scientist or even as a science journalist. It's a huge opportunity to meet people where they're at. And science fiction in general offers us this enormous kind of imaginative playground for thinking about how we can, you know, build a better future. Well, I think that sums up basically everything I care about. So that that was <laughs> wonderfully instructive and <clears throat> and conceived on the spot, but obviously after decades of, of thinking about it and working it and, and marinating on it, which is what, you know, the best science fiction and even, you know, fantasy can do for us, which is just like keep it going up here and making you think of not just like, again, like what is, like you said, the coolest new transportation, but what I seemingly always come back to, I guess, at this point in trying to help people answer the question, what can I do is, okay, that's cool, but what are we going to do with it? Who are we going to help with that? Like, what can we rectify or readjust with that or 
despite that or, you know, in lieu of that. And I think about that with everything from mRNA to, you know, like you said, solar power desalination to all these things. It's going, okay, okay, what of these... I had a, a wonderful scientist on the show, uh, an AI researcher, and she said, I answer old problems with, with new technology. And it is. It's looking at those things and going, okay. And by the way, like, one of the great things of DS9 is is questioning sort of this utopia in, in a lot of ways, right? And, and Battlestar did that very differently, too, you know? I remember when they did torture during the Bush years and things like that. They were like, mm -hmm. I mean, we're not doing it, but we're doing it. And we're going to be like, well, should we do it? Because, they're like, these people are trying to kill us, and yet... Yada yada. So you can do it more overtly. You can do it more fantastically. Whatever, whatever it might be. But I, I, that is where it comes back to it, for me. And even something like, ET, which, oh, they showed on on an IMAX theater like last year, and I got to take my ten year old to it, and I was like, oh, that's amazing. This is going to be the greatest thing. And I was trying not to overhype it, but I was like, just so you know, this is like top three for me. But it's still this question of, what would what would you do? you know, with this other that is trying to survive and wants to get home, which speaks to so much of what we have going on now with climate-induced immigration and, and things like that. It's like, how, how are you going to treat people? And what are you going to do with this with this thing? And I don't know. That, that's that's why I really love this this series, and I'm so glad you you spend time on it. Is there is there sort of a unifying intentionality behind, like, who you bring bring in and, and talk to is it like oh i really loved this thing let me give them a call um or is sort of there some quota or goal or something like that behind what you're going for hmm. it's frankly it's it it is a little less planned out than that it's more driven by you know what i am reading what i am watching what i am consuming and the questions that's raising for me and then oftentimes I get very lucky in my day job as a climate journalist and a science journalist more broadly, because I don't just write on climate, to meet really interesting people who share my passion for really nerdy things. And, you know, we just get to talking after the interview and it turns out they also go to comic cons and give panels on like the science of Star Wars or whatever. And that newsletter. And so it's, it's a mix of getting to talk to a lot of really cool people as a science journalist who also happen to share a passion for science fiction and how it can be this like vehicle for, for meeting audiences in new ways and, you know, getting some really kind of wonky and, and complicated ideas across through something that they are really passionate about already. Sure. And, you know, I just finished Andor season one and I have mm. this really nerdy question about what that like astronomical spectacle in the sky is and how that could actually what was that gonna... well it was crazy yeah uh, yeah well I, I i did a science and fiction post mm -hmm. on it and i called up an astronomer and we talked about meteor showers and like is the eye of aldani a meteor shower like what the heck is it and and her best explanation was maybe it's like the slime trail from migrating fergals, which are those like the, the last whales. big space whales. Yeah, the whales. Yeah, yeah, yeah. See, it's always whales. Yeah, it's, mm -hmm. it's the whale slime trail, like, you know, Good. from thousands of them migrating across the upper atmosphere sure. and, and lighting up in the sky, which is both awesome and just like so absurd. I love it. I'm yeah, like, that's so, the answer. You know, I'm going to go with that. <laughs> yeah. And, and so I, I, I try not to be, <clears throat> you know, um, I try not to be too much of a scientist when I go into this project. I try mm -hmm. not to be like, this is what is technically accurate about, you know, oh, flying yeah. space whales in Star Wars. And this is what, why it doesn't make any sense at all. You know, there's, there's the space in this form. There, there's, there's a, there's a tightrope walk in this form of science communication where you want to be accurate, but you also want to be fun and you want to accept the fact that, in this universe, there are magic people with laser swords who can move things around with their Space hands. Space whales, their mind. right? And that's just like you know, we have to work that in with the laws of physics. We just have to do it. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so it's it's you know, what are the weird questions that pop into my head as I'm reading and watching and consuming science fiction? And who are the latest like fun people I talk to who would be willing to 
sound off for an hour about, you know, the actual science behind dilithium or, or what have mm-hmm. you. So mm-hmm. kind of a hodgepodge. Perfect. Welcome. You're among friends. <laughs> Two, my obvious next question is, is there some fiction in you somewhere after all of this? Hmm. That's a great question. Well, I have dabbled in creative writing over the years, never been so bold as to try to publish anything, but I have a lot of unpublished drafts of stories kind of gathering dust in various hard drives. So (laughs) it's something I I think about getting into at some point in the future. My mom actually is a fiction writer. She's written a lot of books. She's quite prolific. And uh, yeah, so there's a little bit of it in the DNA. It's a really challenging headspace to toggle in and out of with journalism because it's, you know, going from every sentence has to be factually vetted and buttoned up and uh, run by various parties for Mm -hmm. accuracy to whatever the fuck I want to put on this paper. And I hope it sounds good and connects with people. So it's uh it's it's a lot of mental toggling to go between the two that the the times in my life where I've done more creative writing dabbling or you know times where I've been sort of like in between jobs or again finishing my dissertation there was really a lot of time wasted <laughs> in that period but yeah i mean i you know some of my some of the science journalists i look up to the most have pivoted to or balanced a career in science journalism with science fiction writing. And so it is sort of an aspirational goal of mine, not something I'm going to do this year or next year, probably, but get back to me in 10 years and we'll see if I'm working on something. Great. And everything is going to be great in 10 years. So we're, we're we're nailing it. (laughs) Everything's going to be wonderful. (laughs) We're nailing it. I I love that. So uh, one of the Again, I, I worked for a little while in, in the screenwriting trade, and there's still some some things bouncing around there. But but because of my sort of involvement in it and now proximity to it in, in a lot of ways, and then this job, if you want to call it that, I advise this group called Good Energy, which Anna Jane Joyner founded a couple of years ago, and it's fantastic. And basically, it's a new foundation, and what she and her, her cohort do is try to get more First of all, understand how much climate, specifically climate, is in movies and TV today slash the past 10 years, and then proactively try to get more in. And over the course of my loose involvement that I'm so lucky to have with them, you know, it, it has become essentially this question of how do we get literally any climate into, into anything, knowing that uh, the way the sausage is made is very complicated and mostly out of your control. So it's anything from like literally a joke to a whole character storyline or uh, an arc or a setting or whatever it might be. And so they just recently developed their version of the Bechdel test. Are you familiar with the Bechdel test Mm -hmm. Um, in movies and TV? It's basically, God, if I'm getting it right, it's, are there two women in the in the mm-hmm. movie or TV, do they talk to each other and do they talk to some about something other than the love interest, essentially? Yes. I'm, I'm pretty sure that's what it is. I think so that's about right. The, and most movies fail, of course. The climate version that they've come up with, I believe they're calling it the climate reality test, I'll, I'll find it, is does climate change exist in this world in any way and are the characters aware of it? And they just ran the study with Colby College that they came out with this week and they ran, they took IMDb's top basically 250 movies from the past 10 years, which, you know, imperfect ranking, but it's it's something. And mm-hmm. and 11% of the movies qualified answered both questions, which is more than we actually thought it's it was going to be. more than I would have expected. Oh, I was right? like thinking right? in my head, like, all right, we've got Don't Look Up, we've got Geostorm, we've and then got you're The like, Day After. Right. <laughs> but again, we haven't lowered the bar, but, but tried to understand again this process where, again, like you said, you go from journalism where you're like, you better fact check this 40 different ways and they hand it to the 40 groups who have to do it themselves from their perspective. Fiction, which is, you know, there's the science and entertainment group that, that pairs scientists with screenwriters and TV writers and things like that. And that group usually gets that. Look, we're trying to put the best science into these things, but in the end, the story is the thing that is going to win because that's what we're making here, not a documentary. And... Mm-hmm. 40 executives are going to tear it piece to piece and then we're going to screen it and things will change and, and you just have to be cool with that if you want to be a part of this. And 
I think that's why the climate bar is not necessarily low, but like every little bit does help. And this is kind of where I have such an issue with the personal versus systemic action thing, right? Which is, this might be one screenwriter or one TV writer fighting for a, a solar joke in a TV show that's making 30 episodes. And if it gets in there, like, that is a win. And that is because it could reach so many people because it just makes it part of everyday life in some way. Because as you've said, we get so much from our stories. They don't just tell us what the future could be in this perfect world or about lightsabers or, or uh, Ghostbusters. <laughs> You know, like I definitely tried to build a proton pack at one point with a lot of light bulbs. Yeah, it didn't it didn't work, unfortunately. Not enough power. But they tell us who we can be and what we can do with the things we have and, and shine light on the mistakes we've made, not just technology wise, but as a society and an economy and and things like that. And and that is so important going forward. You know, I think about do you know the journalist Ed Yong just recently left mm-hmm. the Atlantic on the Pulitzer? Yeah. <clears throat> his his early COVID piece, where he said, you know, COVID was this lake that exposed, flood that exposed all the cracks that were already in our sidewalk. And um, a lot of cracks, we have not filled them. It's not great. <laughs> and science fiction can do the same thing. It can go, hey, look at all these choices you made to, to get you to this fictional place. What if you make those? But also what could go wrong with some of them? What do you need to make them? But also, you know, there's the more sort of dystopian stuff, which I frankly stay away from right now, or the complicated <laughs> things that go like, you make this choice, this is where it's going. I used to love Black Mirror. It was great. Now I'm just like, that's Tuesday. No, no, thank yeah. you. No, thank yeah. you. Anyways, it's all to say I'm very thankful for your work. And I'm thankful that you do both versions of it because these mineral questions and the people who do it, just like the people who do our health work around whatever technology we're using, that is what matters to make sure we kind of get it right as much as we can by those people. Right. And to include the most people and to make sure they're paid and to make sure it's not creating just prolific amounts of waste and we recycle what we can. Right. Because we've got to do this thing. So let's attempt to do it and ask the right questions in a way that is most beneficial for most folks in the little ecosystems we have remaining. Well, I'm grateful for anyone who is doing any work trying to inject more climate reality into you know hollywood science fiction i think it's long overdue i think there are more people thinking about this all the time but as you say lots of competing priorities lots of uh screenwriters lots of executives ultimately you know it's a balance between entertainment and what works for the audience and you know whatever messages or information that the the writers behind this massive enterprise, you know, want, want to get out there. And I did recently do an interview with Star Trek's resident science advisor, where we talked a little Mm -hmm. bit about that. that. And I think she was very positive on how science has been considered and incorporated into the recent series. Obviously not everything is going to have a explanation that, you know, stands up to like a dissertation defense or peer review, but everything uh, everything that touches on science in some way gets run by an actual scientist and that person has input in the writer's room. And there's, there's something really valuable about that, I think. And I'm really happy to see more efforts directed toward incorporating climate and, you know, our, our collective, our collective problem that we all have to deal with over the next century and that we shouldn't be shying away from in our fiction. So that's awesome that you're involved with that. Well, I'm I'm the world's smallest piece of the puzzle, but it 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 matters, and I care about it. And again, I I was the beneficiary of growing up on so many of these things. My favorite animal is the whale for clearly like a bunch of reasons. Uh, so you know, it 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 matters. It sticks with people, right? No matter what yeah. age you see it in. So, anyways. Well, and if you want an explicit tie-in between my mining and mineral work and the science of fiction, I, I've done a couple of posts that have been good performers for the blog. I did a sort of exhaustive survey of where in the galaxy we might mine lithium beyond Mm -hmm. Earth. After that, I noticed that that theme was starting to pop up in science fiction. There's a season of the expanse on a lithium mining world. Mm -hmm. For All Mankind, another show that I I really enjoy. So features a lithium mining plot on the moon involving like a shootout between astronauts from the US and the Soviet Union. So there's there's been this sort of trickle of interest in science fiction in recent years in 
incorporating what I see as sort of one of the biggest questions and challenges of our time, which is like the resources that we need in order to move into the into the future. So yeah, that is something I, I try to spotlight when I can because it's a little a little bit of a, a a niche that I've you know really made my own over the last few years. It's a niche, but it underpins the whole thing because we have had these yeah, finite resources it's, it's that the powered stuff. the past 200 years and we didn't go about procuring those in the best way and didn't ask even ask really about the costs or externalities involved until now. So doing that now for these resources that are finite and in these difficult or controversially hard to reach places, or they're just under China where most of them are, is we have to ask those questions because we do need them. And, and it would be great yeah. to get them. It would be great if we recycled a lot more of them. But, you know, it's 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 why I believe there. I'm a liberal arts major. It's why I believe there there should be like a chief. Should we do this officer in every in every tech company? Right. It, it, it matters to us. Be extremely helpful. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> aye, aye, aye. All right, Maddie, last couple questions. And this is kind of where the. I don't know what the metaphor is today, but the point is there's so many climate metaphors I can't use anymore. The other day, my 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 kid was like, my gas tank's filled up. I was like, mm, that's out. We can't say rising tide lifts all boats. That's not ideal anymore. There's hmm. a few of them that mm -hmm. are not ideal. Yeah. The point is, how can we help? So we like to focus on things people can do to to donate, to volunteer, to get educated, to be heard with their representative at whatever level, locally or or larger. What are some specific things besides reading your work wherever it goes, including your Microsoft piece from this morning? Good for those folks. Mm. But also subscribing to the Science of Fiction, which has such a cool URL. Is it, it's like sci.fi or science sci, sci of dot fi. Yeah, you can. You, you, it's sci of dot fi. You can yeah, there we go. Finland for that domain. Yeah. 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 <laughs> There's a lot. The Indian available, Ocean was so hot was... for a little while there. People use that one a lot. Yeah. 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 Exactly. So what are some other yeah, specific um, ways you believe in groups doing great work, people doing great work, work that should be followed? Tell me. Hmm. Do you want an answer that relates specifically to the science fiction or to whatever you want? If you are like, people okay. should watch the second season of For All Mankind because it's a perfect season of television and the ending is heartbreaking and wonderful, uh, then you can just say that. <laughs> but if there's other things, we can do that too. Yeah. Well, I guess my first answer will be because I imagine there's a lot of scientists and scientifically inclined folk who listen to your podcast. You know, don't be afraid to get out there into a non-traditional forum and talk about the things that you're passionate about, whether that is going to a local video game or comic convention or giving a talk at a museum or, you know, some sort of public event. I, I think it is really important for people to put a face to science in order to, you know, hopefully help rebuild some of the trust that has eroded over the years. And, and you know, if you're a science fiction fan, if you're a comic fan, if you play video games, if you play board games, there is a convention out there of oh, yeah. like-minded nerds who want to know, you know, why this works mm -hmm. in a phys you know on on a, on a chemistry level on a physics level and are are eager to absorb your knowledge so go to those people meet them where they are and use your shared passion to connect with them that's what i would say for the the science folks in the room for everyone else gosh there's you know i i think again you mentioned this this false debate between individual and systemic action which is just yeah, really frustrating and not something I, I want to get into too much there, but I, I, I am always a why not both type of person. And if we're going to change things on a systemic level, it starts with, I, I, I do believe it starts with, you know, building small grassroots communities. So do something in your community that matters, you know, get involved in a local you know, park cleanup effort. If you're into tinkering and repair, get involved in a repair cafe. These are events that take place all over the world where people bring their old broken down devices and people who have a little more experience fixing them teach you how to open it up and fix it. You know, rather than throwing that thing in the trash or taking it out with your, you know, yearly e-waste haul, learn what's inside it and how it can be repurposed. Yeah. 
I mean, I just, I, I think local and, and grassroots. And I, I, I think we, we got to start small in a thousand different ways. Yeah. Um, at least, at least a thousand. Um, but that, those are all <laughs> opportunities, uh, as we, we desperately try to, to, to paint it. That's it. Important Not Important is hosted by me, Quinn Emmett. It is produced by Willow Beck, and the music is by Tim Blaine. You can read our critically acclaimed newsletter and get notified about new podcast conversations at importantnotimportant.com. Thanks so much for listening, and thanks for giving a shit.